Welcome to the Voice of Salvation programming, whose main source is to be an inspiration to you through the message of hope and peace. And this is only achieved when you remain in tune. Stay with us and you will be blessed. Signs of His Coming Romans 13, 11 says, And that, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The world is grossly unaware of the timetable with which God directs the affairs of man. Even many Christians, who should continually search the Scriptures and know something about the age in which we live and its relation to the coming of Christ, or asleep concerning these things. The Apostle Paul, in writing to the Christians in Rome, assumed that they were aware of the times in which they lived, and he urged them to awake out of sleep and be alert to the events concerning redemption. From all that we read in the Bible and its relation to present-day events, it seems very clear that we are living in the end time of the world under its present order. It is not clear just how long this age will last, but some feel that it could close much quicker than we imagine. The Bible states that no man knows the day or hour in which the Lord will come. Yet this does not mean that we will not recognize the signs of the coming of the Lord as they apply to our age. In fact, we are warned to be alert so that the time does not close in upon us unaware. Some people are trying to find out as closely as possible when the Lord is coming so that they can make last-minute preparations and be saved. My friend, this is a dangerous philosophy. You see, the coming of the Lord may be for the individual much sooner than he realizes. Many individuals get up on the morning of a work day and plan to be home in the evening with the family, only to awake in eternity in a state of unpreparedness. The coming of the Lord for the individual is happening every day, and no one knows when God will call him into account. Oft times the day seems long, our trials hard to bear. We're tempted to complain, to murmur and despair. But Christ will soon appear to cast his pride away. All tears for Sometimes the sky looks dark with not a ray of light, tossed and driven on, no human help But there is one in heaven.
and on that last life's day will soon be yours. All storms forever pass. tells us in the book of Matthew, chapter 24, verse 3, the following. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? The gospel tells us of several visits to the temple by Christ and his disciples. In some occasions, they were used to teach the multitudes and on two visits, we are told how Jesus cleansed his father's house by driving from its outer courts the money changers and also the sellers of sacrifices. As today's message, the Savior has just completed his final visit to the temple, having pronounced woe unto the religious rulers who he called hypocrites, blind guides and fools and deceivers, contaminated by the inward uncleanlessness. Now his farewell speech prophesied that the Jews would persecute believers from city to city, would scourge people in the synagogues and even kill prophets that would be sent unto them. Now soon thereafter, their temple would be desolate, nor would they be worried any more by the Messiah until they were willing to accept his divinity and say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Now having walked from the famous temple whose veil concealing the holy place would in three days be torn from top to bottom, the attention of Christ is called to the beauty of this religious center of Judaism. No doubt, like all their countrymen, the disciples were justly proud of this magnificent building, which, though hardly approaching the costlessness of the one constructed by Solomon, was nevertheless the most outstanding structure in the land, far surpassing any other public building and so far beyond their own houses as to make any comparison seem ridiculous. Now to the disciples it was inconceivable that God's kingdom could any less than choose for its international headquarters this elaborate complex of a building. Now they were not yet willing to accept the truth of the prophecy calling for their Savior's crucifixion. No, he would yet come into his kingdom, and there would still be positions left and right of the throne which two of their number would surely secure. Now imagine their astonishment when Jesus declares that all of this grandeur shall be demolished. And while the rebuilding of the temple is described in Haggai 2.15 as having a stone laid upon a stone, the fate of this building shall soon be that not one stone shall be left upon another. Such an astounding statement understandably caused the disciples to inquire when this event would take place. Then they wanted to know what signs would herald Christ's coming and the end of the world. They possibly referred to his coming to power and to the seizing of the existing world order rather than the actual physical destruction of the earth. Now, as we continue to read the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 24, verse 4 and 5 tells us, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. As of the many earlier occasions, Jesus was trying to convince followers that his 
was not a kingdom of this world. He had come as the Christ and inaugurated a kingdom not of meat and drink, but one of righteousness and truth. And though he had not yet left the disciples, his leave-taking was near at hand. After which, the church of God would face many deceivers claiming to be the Messiah returned to earth. Now later, the ground was prepared for such spiritual wheat sowing when saints were convinced, convinced in their hearts, that the second coming of Christ was already close. So sure were they of this that the famine in Jerusalem within the church has been attributed to this belief. Many sold all their possessions and lived out of a common treasury, completely neglecting business and the earning of a livelihood. Now false prophets arose soon after the ascension of Christ, and many of the Jews who would not receive the Savior were deceived by impostors. The historian Jehoshaphat mentions at least three of these false Christs who arose before the destruction of the temple. And Philip in Samaria ran into one such deceiver. This fellow was supposedly converted in a great miracle work in revival, later visited by Peter and John, at which time believers received the Holy Ghost by the laying of hands. Simon had formerly bewitched the people with sorcery, convincing the least to the greatest that he was the great power of God. Also, we read in Acts chapter 5, where Thedeus, boasting himself to be somebody, led 400 followers to their death. And of Judas of Galilee, who drew away much people, but he perished, and all, even as many as obeyed him, were scattered and brought to naught. And as we continue to read Matthew 24, we read in verse 6 the following, And ye shall hear of wars, and rumors of wars, and that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. As in many Bible passages, it is possible to make two applications from these words of Christ, relating them to the destruction of Jerusalem, which only John, of those now hearing them, would be alive to observe, and also relating to the end of time, in the great day when mankind will be judged for eternity. At any rate, history records the fact that many wars immediately followed the crucifixion of Christ, and that in one two-year period, four emperors died. Yet for all of this, the disciples were instructed not to allow themselves to be alarmed by such serious unrest. While it is difficult to imagine how they were to remain wholly calm in the midst of international chaos, there was a personal salvation, individually obtained and retained, which would comfort the believer whose complete trust for deliverance, both spiritual and physical, was in the Lord. You see, such trust is also possible in this, our day, even as we consider the turmoil throughout the earth. You see, these things must come to pass, and though many signs indicate its proximity, the end of time is not in sight since much remains to be accomplished in the plan of God. On the other hand, we are not to discount the quick work and righteousness, which he is able to do, nor the fact that though his coming seems to be delayed, the individual is not promised tomorrow to get ready and should maintain constant readiness in the face of imminent death on every hand. As we continue to read the Gospel of Matthew 24, we read in verse 7 and 8, something known today as beginning of sorrows. Verse 7 says, For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. And all these are the beginning of sorrows. Now, as we read this, we see that the sorrows prophesied by Christ were not long in making their appearance. And shortly after the conversion of Paul, we read in Acts eleven twenty eight where Agapus, the prophet, predicted a worldwide famine, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Also, it seems that Judea was among the first places hardest hit, which led to the disciples' decision during this time to send relief from elsewhere to the saints at headquarters. Later in history, it tells us that during the siege of Jerusalem, those inside the walls descended to the level of cannibalism before the final overthrow of the city. A further application of Christ's prophecy is indicated 
from the vision of John in Revelation chapter 6, verses 5 and 6, which tells us of one who shall ride a black horse holding balances in his hand while a voice calls out the prices of barley, wheat, oil, and wine, a sign of famine. Next, John saw the rider of a pale horse, one whose name was Death, and who, like pestilence, which often follows famine, would destroy many on the earth. Finally, we are told that in diverse places, earthquakes would occur. All of this prophecy was fulfilled in a limited scope in the first century, but it appears that it will be repeated on a worldwide scale near the end of time with multitudes killed and others terrified at its soon coming. The greatest of all earthquakes shall occur at the moment when the feet of Christ shall touch the Mount of Olives, near where he was seated when the prophecy of our message was pronounced. Now at the time, according to Zechariah 14, 4 and 5, the mount shall split with divisions towards the east and west, creating a north and south valley. In that day, there shall be no more room for false Christs and deceivers, but the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day shall there be one Lord and his name one. Now, as we go back to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 24, we read in verse 9, Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Now, as we read that, we see that jealousy must have been at least partially responsible for some of the persecutions suffered by the early church. For while other Jews lived in terror, there was probably an unmistakable calm and near indifference towards approaching catastrophe on the part of the Christians. Then history tells us that what began as an attack by established religion upon a newborn faith soon found other allies ready to reach out and embrace the opportunity to persecute, especially so when the Jews were foremost in blaming the Christians for any calamity or local or national or international hoping thereby to hasten their extermination. And thus, what originated as persecution on the part of the priests and Jewish rulers grew to a worldwide proportions, with Roman rulers using Christians as scapegoats and massacring thousands in arena games and lighting sections of the ways of the streets with humans, using them as torches. Now the disciples hearing that they shall soon be hated of all nations for their belief in Christ's name must have been sobered almost to the point of terror. No man can welcome thoughts of torture and death unless he is able to understand the reason for it all. And these men were not yet as prepared as they were to become with the reception of the Holy Ghost as power for service, an unction for witnessing that would make them able to testify in the face of certain physical destruction holding fast their profession of faith even in the presence of betrayal from those within their own ranks. For the last days, there are those who expect severe persecution to be the lot of the church, yet this can only be as strong or as lengthy as the Savior will permit it, and the rapture of the righteous shall put an end to all discomfort for those ready to depart. Now as we go back to the book of Matthew, let us read verse 10 and 11. Matthew 24, 10 and 11 says, And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. Now in this particular passage, Jesus repeats again and again the danger of deception from false crises and false prophets knowing that fervent desire for deliverance from persecution, along with near desperation to see the one for whom they suffer, will make the saints more susceptible to anything that sounds plausible concerning his second coming. Two, there is the implication that those setting themselves up as godly men will have the assistance of Satan in the performance of what appears to be miracles. As prince of the power of the air, the devil was able to show mystifying evidences of divine power, knowing that such will sometimes deceive even the honest-hearted Christian. Too many people consider holy anything that is supernatural, failing to realize 
that Satan is spiritual rather than physical and capable of lying wonders. Verse 24 of Matthew, this same chapter, says that many signs and sign workers shall deceive the very elect if possible. And in Timothy we read, that in their later times many shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Now, as we go back to the book of Matthew, let us read verse 13. Matthew 24, 13 says, But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. My friend, endurance is required on our part. With the abundance of false prophets, and the prevalence of persecution, it is understandable why the love of many would wax cold. Such a thing is far too frequent an occurrence in our day, when the one who desires to do good finds evil present with him. Furthermore, we note that salvation, to be eternally profitable, must be retained to the end of the way, whether that way means the last day of the individual's life or the last day of time. In writing to Timothy, the Apostle Paul has described both his day and hours. History gives proof that towards the last days of the early church, many gave heed to deceiving spirits and heresy that caused departure from the faith. And such is the picture for the 20th century in our time. These are dangerous times, my friend. And yet the Lord who provided the saints with overcoming grace in the shadow of crucifixion can sustain the believer in an age when the pitfalls seem to be more spiritual than physical. When the wrestling is not with flesh and blood, but with spiritual wickedness in high places, the danger of false guides, the peril of wonder work and false prophets. Two, We are affected to a degree when those depart from the faith in whom we have over the years built up great confidence in. 1 John 2.19 indicates that some went out because they were never really of us. But how were we to know? Then too it is easy to cool off spiritually when that seems to be the order of the day. And when ridicule is awaiting any who are bold in witnessing. None want the name of fanatic, yet servants of Satan never seem to fear this title. Matthew Henry points out that while the love of many may grow cold, it is not the love of all, and being cold is not yet dead. Now, the end. Matthew 24, verse 14 says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. The last commission of Christ directed to the disciples was to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And we have long considered this a prerequisite to the second coming. Also, for the day in which Paul lived, there was a time when he could write the Romans that the good news of God's kingdom had been heard to the ends of the earth. History declares to us that the known world was evangelized in less than a half century after the departure of Christ. And Paul wrote to the Colossians that they had been reconciled to Christ and that they should continue in the faith grounded and settled and not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which was preached to every creature which is under heaven. Here again is the type of what shall transpire before Christ comes again. Those who endure steadfast in the faith shall be presented holy and unblameable in the sight of God, a necessary condition if they are to be eligible for the great rewards awaiting the faithful, which they shall be able to enjoy while the wrath of God is poured out upon those who have refused his mercy and scorned his grace and fought against his program. I pray that the message today, signs of his coming, is a blessing to your life.